So we will go ahead and start off with selection. Um, the first thing that you're going to want to do to prepare for selection is read that membership membership selection handbook. That's going to be the real big part um, where all of that information is for you to um, find for your selection. Um, selection is by consensus. Um, so we do, um, that is our preferred method. Um, and a member has to have at least 80% approval by the chapter to be considered a selected member for mortar board. Um, and as you're doing that, make sure to follow those national principles that are listed in that membership selection handbook. Um, all candidates that are selected should embody our three tenets of scholarship, leadership, and service. Um, also with this, um, advisors are going to be a wonderful data point for you to ask questions because most of them have been around for several selection processes. So if you have questions about how to handle selection, um, they're going to be your first and best point of information. Um, but beyond that, your section coordinators and the national headquarters and national office staff are going to be wonderful resources for you as well. So if you have questions about performing that selection meeting and how you can do that um, different ways. I know some campuses even go so far as to do blinded um, selection just to remove that extra layer of bias that a name can provide because if you know them, bias is kind of inherent there sometimes. So it's not always that easy. Um, but there are a lot of opportunities for you to do this in, in a way. Um, but a big part of this is to make sure that most of your chapter is present to do it um, so that you have the best candidates with the most um, informed selection process. Anything to add, Gabby? So I was actually, I, I'm, I'm reading the chat. So like, as you're presenting, I'm trying to like answer questions in the chat too. Um, and so I'll just read the question. Um, the question was, are there any minimum guidelines for leadership or service? Um, no, there is not. However, any previous leadership or service experience is a plus. But no, there is no requirement for that. Um, but that's all that I was going to add, Kaylee, <laughs> at least to this slide. Yeah, Anne, do you have a question? Oh, it's not a question, but I was just going to talk about how we addressed that in our chapter previously. Because there's, you know, there's varying degrees. And so we have a lot of students on our campus who do things like undergraduate research, and they might have spent a lot of time in a lab or in a research site. And so um, I know I've we've talked to members about kind of like looking for the ideals in different contexts. So, you know, maybe they've spent most of their time doing research work and it's taken a lot of their time, but you know, that shows initiative, which shows leadership, and maybe there's a topic or something that, you know, addresses something that is service related. The other thing we talk about is looking at looking for potential, um, because we have questions in the application about the ideals. And so sometimes mortar board is the vehicle to really augment that for a student. So augment service or leadership. Yeah, Wonderful. I would, um, I'm sorry, Kayla. I was going to say, I definitely um, agree with that. I currently am a, I'm a career coach. So one of the things that I focus on with my clients is that sometimes when you want to look for a position, they'll have requirements, right? Um, but it's also about the skill set that you have and that you can bring to an organization too. Um, so that's definitely a good point to, to make as well. All right. So after I, oh, sorry, Kaylee. I was just going to also say with the scholarship leadership and service because it is um, a little bit more subjective in that point or this, at least the service and leadership but I would also encourage members to look at if students are working we know that more and more students need um, and have campus or off-campus employment especially as the cost of higher education continues to increase and we all know that inflation is real and so that being said you know, some, some members are going to have a lot of time on their hands to get really involved in everything on campus where others may not because they're working 20 hours a week um, and they can still be great members. And so looking at, have they taken on leadership roles at work? Have they taken on, you know, opportunities or, um, you know, to be committed to their community campus or otherwise in different areas? 
I, I would just encourage people not to simply look at kind of a, the number of student organizations, the number of positions and that type of thing. Wonderful. All right, well, after the selection meeting, uh, one of the big pieces of uh, information for the national headquarters comes up and that is the candidate request. Uh, that can be downloaded from the mortar board website. Um, and I've also included it in this presentation. So once you have the presentation, you have the link right to it. Um, you're gonna complete stage one of the report after your selection meeting. And that is gonna be the first two tabs, the candidate request information and the requested, can requested candidate list. Um, the instructions on how to complete the file are on um, the first tab of that file. And um, one thing to make sure you do is to complete that information as accurately as you can, because um, this is how the national office sends out welcome information emails and all the things like that. So if there's an in incorrect email address, your members aren't gonna get that information. Um, also, one thing to remember is that the candidate request has to be approved by the national office before you tap your members. So we recommend at least two weeks of lead time between your selection for your candidate request being submitted and performing that tapping so that you can make sure that the headquarters does approve all of your members for tapping and initiation. Um, now, it doesn't always take the full two weeks to get it back. It just depends on how many candidate requests the national office has gotten at that time. <laughs> and they do work them work through them as quickly as they can so that you can tap those members. Um, but the best thing about the candidate request is to try and fill it out while you're doing your selection meeting so that as soon as your selection meeting is done, you can send it off to the national office. And there's you know, some extra time there as well um, to make sure that you get those names back, the approval back as soon as possible. And for those of you that haven't created your application or nomination process yet, I would take a look at that to also see what is the necessary information we need so that you can just ask it up front. So for example, we do ask for you know student phone number so that you're not just submitting their name and email, um, but we also like to have phone numbers for our record. We also do ask for home address. We know that sometimes that can be more difficult to get, but we send things out periodically via snail mail and students campus addresses probably won't be good after the spring. And so being able to have kind of a permanent record is also really helpful. So that's information that's a lot easier to collect if the students are filling it in themselves um, than you having to try to, to track it down. Um, that being said, we will, while we do need certain information to approve the CR, if you don't have their home address, depending on timing, we may still approve it, but then you have to get back to us with that information later, which again, isn't great. Um, but if that is what is kind of stressing you out about submitting something, especially to make that two weeks, let us know and we can we can work with you. All right. Okay, the next big part, something we talked about tonight, the Special National Conference, tapping. It's one of the oldest um, parts of Mortarboard, one of the best in a lot of alumni's opinions, because like Katie and Kirsten said, everybody remembers how they were tapped, or most people anyway, and it's always something fun. Um, so we like to call this tapping with purpose. Um, tapping in person is required unless it's physically impossible. Um, and a public and visible tapping is always recommended for a lot of reasons. Um, not only does it make your potential new member feel honored and important and start that buy-in to mortar board early, it also gets mortar boards recognition and name out there to your campus. Um, whether you're tapping in a class or at a meeting for a club or organization or a sports practice um, or by invitation to a certain public spot on campus, the people around that tapping are going to remember that mortar board did this. Um, and that's going to help out your chapter in a lot more ways than one. Um, Many chapters will collect biographies on the applications um, so that they can read something unique about all of the members at those tappings. Um, and it's recommended because then they, they feel that special um, connection to mortar board and they feel like they've been recognized for something really cool. Um, and like you've seen tonight at the special national conference, tapping methods vary by campus. Um, but you know, every chapter 
can do something unique. It doesn't have to be what you've, your chapter's done before. You can come up with something new. Um, some chapters have things that they've historically done for decades at this point, and it's special to their chapter, but there is no requirement that says you have to do what was done before. If you hear something else or you heard something tonight that you thought was really cool and you want to try doing that, you are free to do that. Um, I do want to add in while we were in um, the breakout rooms, one thing that kind of came to my mind as far as tapping um, is something fun. Right, students love fun things, um, either fun things or free things, F and F, right? Um, so, um, one thing that I thought about was having like a game night, right? Like the chapter could host some type of game night, like Kahoot or trivia or whatever it may be. Um, and they can invite the candidates out or potential um, candidates out. Um, and tell them, you know, invite your friends or what have you, kind of make it like a whole thing um, where everyone, you know, comes to this space and then they can tap them there. So, it's kind of like a surprise thing. Um, and I kind of related it to like sororities and fraternities. When people are interested in joining a, um, an organization, they normally want to go to as many events as they can so they can be seen, they can be known, the people in the chapter can know their faces. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking about it in that way, they may want to come out and be known, be seen, um, not knowing that, hey, you're actually being tapped, you know, <laughs> this night too. So that's also something that's kind of like, I think a different idea, um, kind of fun too, as far as tapping outside of, I know some colleges or some chapters have issues as far as like getting the class schedule, whereas some other chapters, it's easy to get the class schedule for the student, right? Um, so it varies, but that's just an additional idea to have. One other thing that I do wanna mention really quick is that if you do choose to tap in a class, um, make sure you reach out to the professor of that class to make sure that you have permission to <laughs> interrupt a class or be come in at the beginning or end um, to tap that member. Same thing with uh, organization or a club meeting or a sports practice. Make sure you reach out to either the coach or the president or advisor of that organization to make sure that you can come in. Um, being in a sorority myself, I know that our meetings were closed so that if someone wanted to come into that, they'd have to come in beforehand um, to do that. So. Um, just make sure you're reaching out with enough advance notice so that you can get in there. Um, after tapping, the national office will be sending out a welcome email to all of your new members um, to let them know how to log in and pay their dues. Um, so you'll, they'll get all that information from the national office. Um, they send out um, how to do that with a link and instructions on how to do so. And with the local dues, um, the national office has two options. They can either collect those for you and then we'll send you those, um, those fees um, or you can collect the local dues yourself. So that is something to think about um, because you will need to let the national office know if they will be collecting uh, local dues for you as well as how much they are if they're going to. Um, on top of you know, national offices email out to the new members, we encourage the chapter leadership to send out an email to the new members as well. If you haven't already communicated this specific information to um, the new members was while you were tapping them. And it's best to do it anyway, because when you get tapped, you don't remember a lot of things because it's kind of surprising. Um, but make sure to let them know when initiation is and where it is, um, when the chapter meetings are held so that they can start coming to those, as well as um, any kind of orientation meeting or event that you're having for them. Um, or mortar board events that are coming up that they should attend, as well as starting to outline the leadership opportunities for positions within mortar board. Because in order to have, you know, decent officer transitions, it's best to get those elected as soon as possible so that they can have time to really transition with the current chapter officers and make sure that any information that they need for the next year is shared. Gabby, did you have anything to add for that? Not this time. <laughs> Perfect. Kristen, did I miss anything important for the national office? Great. All right, moving on. So orientation and initiation. Um, orientation is a really important part of, you know, the onboarding process for new members because it really inspires them to be active and participate in mortar board. Um, and it also can create a bond with them as a mortar board class because most mortar board chapters are a year of membership, it's really important that, to, that you get those members to bond together as soon as possible so that they feel that camaraderie with their fellow members. Um, 
orientation is a great time to share information about Mora Board, um, the ideals, any traditions that there are on your campus, as well as any projects or events that are coming up or that they have done in the past that worked out um, so that the chapter can do those or possibly you know, build and change on things that might not have worked out the best. Um, this could be done in a special meeting with just the new members or in a retreat format. I know, I believe Ohio State does a really cool new member retreat. <laughs> I've heard about some in the past. Um, so that's a great option as well. Or you could do it at your standard meeting um, so that they can also bond with the mortar board members that are current and maybe keep in touch beyond if they have questions for them. But it's just really important that it's a unique situation for them to feel uh, appreciated and, and like that they're a part of something really cool. Um, my one suggestion on this is try to have food. I know people really like food at meetings. I go to meetings if there, there's food there. So um, it's always something to consider. But I've heard chapters have gone out bowling or, you know, to do escape rooms or fun things like that. So if you have the funding for that, it's always a great idea to do something like that, or you can do something on campus. It's really just up to your chapter. Gabby, did you have anything to add on that one? Okay. Sorry about that, Kaylee. No, I do not. No, <laughs> I received fine. a call. I'm sorry. I was trying to get off the phone. <laughs> not a problem. Um, so moving on to the second part of orientation and initiation is the initiation ceremony. Um, so with COVID removing the ability to do in-person initiation the past couple of years, we know that a lot of chapters and members have never experienced an in-person initiation ceremony. The national office and your section coordinators are here to help you. Um, there are some great resources on the website that can help you coordinate and plan an, in an initiation ceremony as well as your advisors that have been there. They probably have seen an in-person initiation and can help you figure out the logistics to doing an initiation ceremony. Now, if you have a smaller chapter or you know, are really struggling to plan an initiation ceremony, we will be doing a virtual initiation again this spring um, on April 16th. Um, the national office will put that on and we will be happy to initiate your members with you in attendance um, and still have that same sense of, um, well, I want to, <laughs> my words are failing me, but that sense of honor and tradition there. Um, and it worked out really well in the fall. We initiated seven chapters worth of members and it was a really great event. So if you do need that, please let the national office or your section coordinator know ahead of time so that we can continue to keep in touch with you about that and how that, how that will work. Um, the initiation handbook is on the mortar board website and has a lot of that very um, good information on how to plan and execute an initiation as well. So that is another res uh, resource that you can use when you're planning your initiation ceremony. Um, some things to think about um, with initiation are um, when will you be holding it? <laughs> Where are you going to hold it? Um, you know, make sure that you review that initiation information on how to do it. And then does your chapter have any specific traditions that have gone along with the initiation ceremony in the past? Um, your advisors, like I said, are a great resource for that, as well as chapter alumni. Um, you can reach out to the national office and they can provide a list of your chapter's alumni and you can reach out to them and get them involved with your initiation ceremony by asking them how they did it. Um, they can also let you know what you need to have in order to complete it successfully. Um, there are some things that are nice to have with that initiation ceremony that allow that tradition to shine through. As well as, are you inviting spectators? I know some campuses still have regulations on if people can attend events or not, so make sure that you check with your campus to make sure that you're good to go there. Um, but are you going to invite families? If you're a nomination process campus, are you going to invite the people that nominated your new initiates? Um, key faculty or staff members, as well as any honorary members that have been initiated on your campus this year. And again, those alumni. Um, I know I love it when the Ohio Northern chapter asks me to come back, even though I'm also their section coordinator. So it's like two birds, one stone. But um, I love going to initiation ceremonies. It always brings back wonderful memories for me. So if you're looking for alumni engagement, that's a wonderful to start that off.
really quick, Haley. Um, something that was mentioned in the chat, University of Louisville. Um, and I really, really like this idea. Um, it said that one, uh, one thing I sometimes do is circulate the new member list to our honorary members, usually faculty or administrators, to congratulate new members. And the students normally get a kick out of being recognized. And I really like that, but also I really like the fact that a president or provost um, is an honorary member. Like I really like that idea. Um, and that's something that I honestly wish I would have thought about while I was at Eastern. <laughs> um, so I would definitely be spreading that to my chapters. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, we, we try, well, usually I have to <clears throat> encourage this, but we try to have an honorary member once a year be inducted because um, the people come and go on campus. And we have maybe about 20 honorary members. Who some of them show up and answer sometimes, but uh, just to show that they're visible and they support the organization is helpful. Yes, and you can always reach out to the national office to find out if your president or provost is already a member of Mortar Board. And if they're not, they're like, like they've said, it's a wonderful idea to get them to be an honorary member. And as a reminder, you get each chapter gets three honorary members a year that you can have go through the process. So there is a honorary membership piece um, and it's on the CR and then there's a petition for that and part where we check to see if they have previously been initiated as a member and just to make sure that they also kind of hold up um, the value of scholarship, leadership and service. But usually we take your your word for it. But we do a quick review, obviously, just to do due diligence. And they become great advocates for the chapter as well. Um, and so I would definitely encourage you, if you haven't thought about that yet, to definitely consider honorary members. They don't have to apply. They also don't have any membership dues. So we absorb all of those, those costs for um, kind of new member pins and certificates. And they're usually really pleased when students recognize them and when it comes from the students. Definitely. I know Wilson recently got to tap an honorary member. So that would be really cool to, to invite a section. Yeah. Board in. Yes, we did. Um, we did the um, interim president along with the uh, Dean of School Engineering at the uh, University of Louisville. So J Jerry, I mean, if you guys track the social media, see a mortar board, um, you will see that in the, uh, those pictures, both Instagram and, and, um, and um, Twitter. All right, so after all of this, things to still be thinking about, which you know we haven't given you up at this point, I'm sure. Um, so after initiation, you need to submit the official membership report. Now, the official membership report is actually the same document as the candidate request. So you're going to want to pull up that one that you sent to the national office and submit parts three and four um, and fill those in, which is um, the candidate payment status, as well as the invoice and continuing seniors um, piece of that. Again, instructions are all in the form, but if you have any issues filling that out, let your section coordinator or the national office know and we can help you. After initiation, make sure that you're still engaging your new members, as well as holding on to those current members before they graduate. Um, have meetings, have everybody attend. I know it's easy, you know, towards the end of your senior year to kind of say, eh, I'm done. But um, make sure that they still feel included um, and in the transition to the new chapter. Um, and again, make sure that you're holding officer elections and transitions as early as possible once you have those new members um, initiated. Um, you can hold elections at your orientation meeting or a new member retreat or the first meeting with the new class after they're initiated. Um, and just make sure that the officers have plenty of time to transition their new officers as that is one of the recommendations and resolutions for this year. Um, we wanna make sure that officers who are coming into the position are aware of their responsibilities and the things that they will need to do for the chapter to continue on into the next year. Um, we know that a lot of officers from previous years have said, well, I really don't know what I'm doing. I didn't get transitioned that great. Um, and it's kind of hard, especially when there's, you know, the national conference in the summertime with a lot of wonderful information um, that they know that that's something they should be planning for and can attend, um, especially this year with the virtual conference. 
Um, it's not just one person from each chapter that can come. You can have multiple people come. Not that multiple people can't come to the in-person um, conference, but the virtual option allows for a lot more members to be able to attend that as well. Um, so make sure that your officer transitions are talking about that and making sure that they know about that, as well as any other responsibilities and things that they need to know. Gabby, did I miss anything? Yeah, I was thinking if there was anything else I need to say. I know it's a lot of information, you all. But that was pretty much, I think that pretty much summed everything um, summed everything up. It's just very important for those officer transitions <laughs> to occur prior to them graduating. I know that when I was at Eastern, that was one issue that we had is that the transitions weren't like lining up. So we had to figure that out. And I know if that's one issue that a lot of chapters run into as well. And sometimes how the chapters kind of like fall off a little bit for lack of better words, um, because there's nothing like stable there. So just, I just wanna emphasize officer elections <laughs> as well. Great, well, does anybody have any specific questions that they wanted to ask? We do appreciate you guys coming tonight and being here. Um, if you think of something later after this, please feel free to email any of us. We're more than happy to answer questions anytime. Um, we're always available. Absolutely. And there is no, I don't believe, and you can correct me, Kirsten and Kaylee, I don't believe there's a maximum on how many members can be tapped. So tap them all, but I don't know. No. <laughs> there, yeah. I mean, technically there is, there's both a minimum and maximum right. based on the size of your chapter, according to the bylaws. Um, rarely and that's one reason why we ask you to submit your CR in advance but it's it's a pretty large number so I know in the last two years we've never had a school go over um we will often have schools that tap fewer than they should or select fewer than they should and we do encourage them to go back and select more in part because of the bylaws sometimes I know it's just been hard especially post pandemic with getting information out to um, kind of yield enough interest. And so we will make exceptions for chapters. And then we encourage those chapters to do a supplementary fall selection to be able to kind of make their class. Um, but basically what we don't want you to do is there's a lot of honor societies out there that are, to be honest, for profit um, or not very selective looking at scholarship, leadership, and service, and they just send something and try to get as many members as possible. And we don't want 200 members from a class because that's not, that's not going to be, um, you know, the, the, the excellence that we want to continue to have. Like I said, rarely is there an upper cap that our chapters, our chapters go beyond. Um, and if that is, that's a great problem to have. And then we can, we can chat about it. But I also say that because not every student you select, as much as we assume every student who gets selected will join mortar board, that isn't always the case. So as a reminder, and I know Kaylee mentioned this before, we, we never want finances to be a reason a student doesn't join, right? So each chapter automatically has one gift membership thanks to an endowment um, from generous donors. But if there are ever more students than the one gift membership, please work with your section coordinator or the national office. We have a lot of generous alums and others who will gladly probably sponsor those students. Again, we don't want financial barriers to be a reason. Um, but even without that, sometimes there are students that decide, you know what, I'm in too much. I don't have time. You know what, I thought this was something. Again, that's one reason why orientations and a special tapping makes students realize why. But knowing that not every student always accepts if you want a class, let's say of 30, don't select 30, right? Select 35 um, or 40, and then you're most likely gonna get a class of 30. So, you know, just to repeat that, still select more than your goal size of your class. And if you get really lucky, you'll get all of them. And if you get really lucky, you get all of them. And again, that's not gonna push you over the standards so yeah other questions Kaylee and Gabby you did such a good job putting all that information out and, and presenting it 
but I know it's a it's a lot. There's a lot of a lot of details. Has everybody seen the candidate request form online? If not, I'd be happy to kind of pull it up and, and share the screen. Um, I know it looks, um, you know, it's it's a big spreadsheet with a lot of information. Again, the, the first tab is the instructions, as Kaylee mentioned. The second tab is really important. And this is where you'll wanna work with other members of your chapter and your advisor, particular, particularly around who is receiving your membership packet, right? Because the address that you list will be where certificates and pins and other information go before initiation. So if your advisor is gonna be out at a conference for two weeks prior to initiation, maybe you don't want that to be the address. Um, definitely make sure that you're working or if you're someone that doesn't check your mail that often because sometimes people just don't check their mail, then you might not wanna be the person that is receiving that. So definitely work to make sure where the best address is. We will often have um, notification from you know, FedEx or, or United States Postal Service, depending on the speed by which we have to send it, saying it's been received. And we'll get calls from chapters saying, we don't have our, our certificates and our initiations in two hours. And at that point, obviously we can't, we can't send them. Um, so definitely kind of keep your eyes open on that. That's again, another reason why we wanna make sure we have information early enough because when we're printing a lot of certificates, at the same time, we want to make sure you get all of the things that you need for that, that special initiation. Yeah. Jerry, you know? Know, if I could, if I can make a quick uh, request, I, I don't want to pile too much uh, work on the section coordinators, but uh, it helps us advisors actually to have support from the, the national level uh, to check in with us in a couple of weeks and say, okay, how's recruitment going? Who's your recruitment uh, chair? What's your timetable? Stuff like that. Uh, because it would, it would certainly help me, and I suspect we're not the only chapter in this uh, situation. We will definitely do that, and uh, mm -hmm. I can talk to my other fellow section coordinators as well and make sure that they are doing that as well. Yeah, just to keep keep the team spirit up, and because uh, the what happened with us is we recruited last fall, and it was a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate that. But we don't have enough students to keep our chapter going till May 2024. After we graduate. So we, we, we have to recruit and give, uh, give support would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. This is a lot of work. Definitely. And actually, the, uh, t t actually the uh, reason that you do the, uh, the tapping and the membership selection in the spring semester because then you know depending on the uh, the class you have those people that is going to be around for the following year actually i i spent some time looking at what justin has sent over for from osu i think there is a lot of good information that they put down uh to be asked especially the graduation day i think often uh chapters don't don't just put that down because, you know, you can have someone that have a lot of hours, you know, a student, but they may not be graduating um, at uh, depending on their program requirement, residencies and, and a lot of different factors. So I think those are really important to ask, uh, you know, questions that I think will be uh, ideal. Um, having a fall selection is really a supplemental um time to uh, to increase the membership and, and instead of doing the spring selection so that that should continue to be the main focus kirsten i i have a question for you um how quickly you think the um the video link uh you know of, of our recording will be sent because i i just know that we, we like to get it out to our chapters as soon as possible. This meeting? Yeah, and, and the SNC as well. Well, this one will be really quickly because we don't necessarily need to edit it the same way that we do the SNC one. Got it. So you'll have this one first. Um, okay. 
actually as early as the Zoom people tell us it's available, we'll send you the link. Okay. And then we edit the other one, um, especially because of the breakout period and some other times. But there was some dead time. Once we edit that out, we'll we'll send the SNC one out too. Okay. Got it. Thank you. And let us know, you know, obviously the FCs, but also our office, we have often done, you know, if there's things that we can take off your plate, if it's hosting a, an online information session, you know, and sometimes we have alums that are also close enough to come to the campus to even be there in person for an information session. But if it's, you know, Jerry, to your point, trying to heighten excitement to be able to recruit during a term, you know, there's, there's, you know, we have a lot of people in the Cincinnati area, for example, that aren't as far away or, or maybe somewhere else that can come in person. But at the very least, we can always do a virtual information session. Oftentimes between the tapping and the initiation, if you want, if you need to do the orientation virtually, it's another area, your section coordinator and or the natural office or both can help with that. We've even helped to you know, provide some of the chapter history. <clears throat> In an ideal world, that chapter history is kept with the chapter, um, but we know that that is not always the case. That's why, you know, at the end of the year, sometimes people are like grumble a little bit on our, uh, the reports that we ask people to kind of update their history, but that's exactly why. So we have record of it. So when a chapter a year or two from now says, I don't know anything about my chapter, and we can help to get them the support they need. Does anybody have anything else before we finish up? If not, I know it is getting late, so we will let you all go. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, like I said, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, everyone.